Tell me about yourself, Mr. Marlowe. I suppose I have a right to ask. Sure, but there's very little to tell. I'm 33 years old, went to college once, and can still speak English if there's any demand for it. There isn't much in my trade. I worked for Mr. Wilde, the district attorney, or as an investigator once. His chief investigator, a man named Bernie Oles, called me and told me you wanted to see me. I'm unmarried because I don't like policemen's wives. And a little bit of a cynic, the old man smiled. You didn't like working for Wilde? I was fired for insubordination. I test very high on insubordination, General. That was a quote from The Big Sleep by Raymond Chandler, our next book and discussion. <laughs> I was trying to be dramatic. Did that come off? It yeah. might not have. I was like, I feel like she's trying to get me hyped right now, and so I will be hyped. Yeah. I will bring the energy. Do it. Because <laughs> it's 8.30 in the morning on a Sunday, you guys. Sunday it's fun day. Early as hell. But we're here. It's book and bitch time. Because we love books. We love this shit. We love bitching. Yeah, I do love that. I love a good bitch. Um, but hi, I'm Raven. Um, I am your co-host for this adventure through this Nin- murder mystery 1940s hour. 1940s yes. noir, noir Los Angeles murder mystery. Let's see how many times we can say floozies in an episode. Yes. <laughs> that is the word of choice in this episode. And my co-floozy this yeah. <laughs> Today is Jenny Kubel. It's Jenny Kubel. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, guys. It is so early. Good. Early as hell. It is. But it's okay. We've got a good book today. We've got good discussions. We're here um, for it. Exactly. Well, if you've never listened before, you can find Book and Bitch on our website. You can. Bookandbitch.com. Bookandbitch.com. We made it so easy for you. It is very easy. Very simple. Uh, Yeah. Where else can they find us? Yeah. Or if you don't like websites, you're more of a social media person, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter. Yeah. At bookandbitchpod. We're there. Yep. Also super easy. Can't miss it. So easy. Yep. Gosh. I mean, how can we make this easier for you? I don't know. I don't think we can. I don't, I don't think we can. I don't think we can either. If you just can't get enough of this lovely banter, mm-hmm. you can find us both on <laughs> social media as well. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Raven underscore co-op or coop, however you want to say it. I'm also one of the co-hosts on Co-op the Podcast, um, which you can find at Co-op the Podcast uh, on uh, any social media site. Jenny, where can they find you? They can find me on Twitter and Instagram at glcubel underscores rights. Like, rights like a writer. I love that you have to clarify. Well, I never, we now have to I clarify know. every episode. Well, I never thought to clarify it until you pointed it out. And I was like, well, shoot. I gotta I, do that now. I wonder if there's an alternate universe where you're super into politics. Oh, And maybe. you're actually glcubel underscore so rights. rights. Like yeah. human rights? Human rights. Interesting. A multiverse. Um, multiverse. That's interesting. That could be very interesting. That could be very interesting. Um, okay, so what else do we have going on? I'm trying to think if we have any specific announcements. Um, I got a really cool phone case. It has oh, Lisa, it's Lisa Frank. Frank. It, has it li- finally came. It finally came. Ugh. Is it sparkly or did I imagine that? Um what it is is there's like it's so thick. It does look really it's thick. It's so thick. It's a uh, very 90s. It is very <laughs> 90s. Um but it has like this uh water. It says it's like sand, like magic sand, but I'm like no, this is like a water kind of thing and it changes from like orange to pink. So I have that going on. Oh, that's crazy cool. Yeah, that's pretty dope. I'll let you see it closer yeah. later. I think yes. I imposed the sparkles on it. I was like, I want sparkles to be on I there. think they had one that had sparkles on it. Ooh. On their website. But I didn't get it for three weeks, so I'm not promoting them whatsoever. Uh, and when I yeah. messaged them, I was like, it was the last day for it to come to me, and my shipping said that it w- they still hadn't received it. And I was like... 
hey, so what's going on with this? She's like, you just have to give it time. And it looked like that day, like after I had emailed them, they had finally taken it to the post office. Uh. And so it didn't get here until Friday. So I'm like, you're rude. They were like, oh, shit, we got to get this out. Yeah, but you have to be patient. I'm like, I am patient. But I like it when things arrive when they say they're going to arrive. I was about to say, you didn't email until the last day it was supposed to arrive. So Yeah, exactly. You were patient within their time frame. Exactly. I gave them enough time. They had enough time. Yeah. Well, it looks great. Thank you. That's all that matters. Yeah. I want to talk about that a little bit. Any announcements? What's going on in your life, Jenny? Um, nothing too much. I've been spending a lot of time updating my GLCubel website. Mm-hmm. I just put up a whole new projects list so you can see all the things I work on when I'm not doing not, your day job. Yeah, not working or <laughs> not drinking coffee. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The website's so cute, though, too, you guys. It's oh. like all coffee themed. You have to go check it out. It is. I have two brands, writing and coffee. That's yeah. all it is. Exactly. Yeah, so... That's pretty fun. Um, oh, it's going to come out this Monday. I'm really excited for it. Well, it'll be a few Mondays for you guys by the time you hear this episode. Yeah, it's already come out. So go yeah, go, go ch- back in time and go check and it check out. Check it out. But yes. we're doing a Meet the Bitches series. Meet the Bitches! I'm so excited, guys. So excited. It's going to be on Instagram and Twitter, but you'll get to see little snapshots of us. Yes, and all of our beautiful bitchy glory. Yes, exactly. Fun facts, trivia. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Maybe. now I have to come up with, like, I was talking to my husband, Jesse, about it, and I was like, now I have to, like, actually come up with, like, interesting things about myself. Uh, oh, you have what? interesting things. I think I am an interesting person. I'm a bit much. So I'm like... <laughs> that I could be to... your first post. <laughs> yeah. Raven was too much for this post. <laughs> yeah. So here, enjoy a picture of her cute dog. <laughs> that might be what Aww. I do. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. But I'm excited for that. I'm excited for you guys to meet us. Um, If you guys haven't listened to any of our other episodes, we really um, recommend it. It seems like a lot of people really like our Where the Crawdads Sing episode. Uh, But we have plenty of other ones like our Shirley Jackson, um, We Have Always Lived in a Castle. That was our first episode. It was a very good episode. It was a very good episode. And I've gone full witch now that the full moon is out. You've gone full Shirley Jackson. I've gone full full Shirley Jackson. I'm casting spells. I'm hexing publishers. Man, I'm, I gotta find her spell books for you. She you had like these really weird do. old Amish spell books. I love it. I need some Amish spells. I have to have that. I um, but, but you should also listen to, I mean, we just came out with like our It episode and It Chapter 2 just came out. So you should give that one a listen. So you kind of like what we thought about the book and how you can compare that to the film because they're very different. In our um, episode of Call of the Podcast, we actually talk about um, this past one. So episode 32, we talk about it, chapter two. Nice. Uh, so you can kind of compare oh, contrast. That would be really cool. Okay, yeah. go listen to the Book and Bitch episode first because that's part yes, one. it's the book. Then go listen to Co-op episode 32. Exactly. that's part two. Exactly. And also go watch the movie because it's really good. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. You should watch all those movies. All right. Let's get this shit started. All right. Let's jump in. Per usual, we'll go ahead and do a quick bio of Raymond Chandler and then a synopsis of the book and we'll dive right on in. Yay, yay, yay. All right. So Raymond Chandler was born in Chicago on July 23rd, 1888. Which to me makes him sound like he's really old at the time that he writes this book. But billion not, years old. Right? And like in the 1800s. Jesus. Aye, aye. He was the only child of an Irish born mother and a Pennsylvania father. Um, he spent most of his early years in Nebraska. And his father, who struggled with alcoholism, left the family. So Chandler's mother moved them to Ireland in 1895 and then on to England. So he spent most of his formative years in England. Um, He was educated at Dulwich College. He placed first in classics at his school and third overall, which I thought was very writerly of him. Yeah, it's also very England to have them ranked (laughs) in each subject. (laughs) Yep, and then third overall. Yeah, that's Uh, crazy. We uh, have those that, though. Like, we have Valedictorian and Salutatorian and... But only in, like, high school and... College? College. Yes. 
Yes. I'm I did. Of, I wasn't any of those. So. You know, it's really funny. I remember exactly who my high school valedictorian is. I cannot remember who it was at college. Oh, it's because you probably knew the person in high school. Like, that is true. Did you know the person in college? <laughs> Maybe not. I probably, I don't think I knew the person in college at all. Yeah. That was definitely not my group of friends. I'm so sorry, per- valedictorian of Butler class of 2012. I'm not. You can fuck off. You oh, should have done cooler stuff in college. <laughs> you should have been a little crazier. Yeah, you should have smoked more weed. <laughs> <laughs> then I would know your name. Then I would probably know your name. Anyways, All keep right. going. All right. He was so, a nerd. So. He was a nerd. He took a uh, clerkship in the British Admiralty, decided he didn't like it, so he left to be a freelance journalist. Another interesting thing. We've had a lot of authors who started out as journalists and then... Our next okay. episode is going to have somebody that was oh, also hey. a journalist. See, so. it's apparently the thing to do. You start out as a journalist and then you're like, nah, I'm going to write books. Exactly, because journalism kind of sucks. As I mean, a journalist, yeah. as a journalism major. I feel like journalism is hard in that you constantly have to be coming up with stories and you have to do it fast because you want to be first to release and first to press. Yeah, exactly. So it's a lot of pressure. And there's no, like, if you're one of those con- like if you're really creative and you're one of those content creators it, journalism does not cater to that you're not doing these like you- long romantic prose or anything like that it's get to the business people are here for like a couple of sentences they want the news and that's it yeah. that's kind of what journalism is unless you're doing like editorial work but when you're starting off, you might not necessarily be doing those big yeah. features. Yeah. So. And you don't want to get too creative to begin with because then you seem biased. Yeah. And people do not like that in journalism. Well, nope. well, some people, I guess, like that in journalism. I guess a lot. You're of... not supposed to like that in yeah, journalism. Yeah, certain uh, <laughs> TV channels love it. But you're not supposed to because I did take a an ethics and journalism class and it was all about how you have to stay like right in the middle and like... Talk, we talked about this is totally off topic. I'm sorry, you guys. But how um, FDR, when he got polio and he was in a wheelchair, the journalists made a group decision during World War II to not like take pictures of him in the chair and yeah. like to not um, tell people that he was crippled because they wanted to seem stronger and so and have us all united and wanted to make sure that everybody felt united under our leader our president a strong leader exactly who can get us through this war so they didn't do that they made that group decision even though it wasn't necessarily ethical in journalism and that story i literally can't tell you another fucking thing from that class uh-huh. that's the only thing that stood out to me well, i can't fun. i don't remember anything from a lot of those classes yeah but that made an impact. And I really, I've heard that story before too. And I really love it mm-hmm. just because of the, what do I want to say? They like crafted this whole new reality almost. Yeah. Like just they had journalism. Him, like he had to be kind of, I mean, this is, t- I mean, I feel like I'm not using the correct terms right now, but he had to be propped up. <laughs> That's so awful. Well, yeah. They yeah. used to have him at to like the podiums podium. and he would like grip the edge of the podium. Exactly. Because he's then... basically having to. Hold himself up. Hang there, yeah. Yeah. I Hang mean. in there, FDR. Oh, oh no. Give it a little kitten. He's one of those posters. <laughs> all FDR. Oh, or, I've oh. used that. I mean, I no, would. that's terrible. Uh, random side note. The Roosevelt family is my favorite American dynasty. Yeah. I've been to the Roosevelt house in New York. It's oh, so shit, great. really? Yeah, it's so that's cool. super cool. It's Teddy Roosevelt's, like, family house. And everybody loves Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, Teddy Even Roosevelt though he was, was a dick. He was a dick with a big stick. With a big stick. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess that's why. Yeah. I mean, that's he, why he came up with it. He was like, let me let everybody know that I have a giant dong. Yeah. He was like, you fuck with me. I you, get you. <laughs> you get the dong. You get the dong. No. Oh. oh, no. I'm sorry, oh, Daddy. This oh. has nothing to do with literally the book. It, it doesn't. I mean, I but guess I love it. Chandler was kind of around in the air he was. The Roosevelt's. yeah he was he sure, totally sure. was he probably loved teddy roosevelt mm. so much he might have i think he was in, in england at the time although okay another, that was a great segue back another oh point. no i was about to segue into another <laughs> oh, shit. yes i love it i was Go about ahead. to say at the time teddy uh roosevelt sent his eldest sister struggling to remember her name now i think it was anna Anna Bammy Cows. He sent her to England to work as a governess. <laughs> let me 
I'm sorry. She's like, you're like, I'm struggling to remember. And then you literally yeah, just. Yeah, I remembered. <laughs> I was and it like... sounds like you even said, like, I don't think it was a nickname, but it's like, you know her so well. Yeah. You're like. The Roosevelt family is my favorite. I know. You knew. You knew the whole I time. I did. In my mind, I was thinking Edith for some reason. I don't know why. I mean, it was maybe one Roosevelt somewhere. I mean, Edith was Ew. for sure a popular name back in the day. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. But anyway, Teddy sent her to England to work as a governess for, I believe, the prime minister's children. Mm. And basically what she was doing is she was infiltrating their family and then, like, yeah, like, gathering intel for Teddy and then also, like, influencing, like, the prime minister to make certain decisions. Shit! Yeah, it's, like, this super wow. interesting story. And I was like, you Roosevelt's, that's so clever. That's so clever. I love that. Okay, that does actually remind me. I'm sorry, last side, sidebar. Okay, then we'll go back to Raymond Chandler. Yeah, sorry, we'll give Raymond. him his due. Um, There is a podcast that I absolutely love right now called Noble Blood. I think it's very popular at the moment, but it talks about kind of like all these um, uh, nobility and they die. So it's a lot about death and um, losing their crown and kind of what they're willing to go through to have their crown or the stories of how they tragically die. Like, I think the first episode is Marie Antoinette, which is like the most obvious but like one of the other ones is um the romanoffs and how i didn't know this but uh george king george or george romanoff i don't remember i can't i got no it's peter no i can't Mm. remember i'm sorry but like just basically how the king of russia at the time that eventually gets murdered or sentenced to death um he he was cousins with the king of england at the time and like best friends like they grew up together and you have no no idea that that was even a connection that they had (sighs) and um like it just talks about kind of like their relationship together and how it affected kind of how the romanoffs eventually die is so interesting yeah noble blood go give it a listen i forget who the host is but she's amazing and it's so well researched like researched and so well like put together it's amazing noble blood Everybody, go listen. Yeah, okay. I'm going to go listen. You should I go listen. That. I was like, we're talking about, like, this infiltration, and that's sometimes a lot of, like, the secretive kind of stuff that they yeah. do. And I was like, you'll like you'll like this. I do like the sound of this. Yes. Do All it. right. Go check it out. I'm going to go do it after we record. Raymond Chandler. <laughs> All right. Raymond Chandler. Okay. So he moved back to the United States in 1912, moved to Southern California. So cat. Um, he bounced around a little bit. And then when World War I started, he was 29 at the time, he went to Canada and enlisted in the Canadian Army, which I find very interesting. I don't know why you wouldn't was, enlist in the um, yeah, why you wouldn't enlist in the American Army. But one of his uh, biographers, Frank McShane, actually noted, only the 20th century could produce the scenario of an American-born Anglo-Irishman traveling to Canada in order to join the Scottish regiment to fight Germans in France. Yeah, there's a lot (laughs) of things going on there. (laughs) It's just very interesting. It's like, wow, it's so interconnected and convoluted. Yeah. And I still don't understand why you wouldn't just enlist. I mean, maybe the Canadian army is squishier. Maybe they're just like more comfortable. They might be. I don't know enough about... Also, 29 is like ancient for yeah enlisting for enlisting yeah that's the point where you're like you should be in command of somebody else or you should not be maybe that's why he went to canada is because he knew maybe they were gonna let him be an officer of some sort i don't know Mm, but that is like ancient that's like that's my age (laughs) (laughs) i know it's like at the same time, like, a woman gets married at 29. Jesus Christ. I know. Also ancient. I know. So ancient. Well, so ancient. in that time, I guess I think a lot of, like, all of the men who were, like, 16 and 17 that, like, forged their birth certificates so they could join. So it seems, you know, it seems astronomically ancient. Yeah, exactly. And they had already died because they had no common sense. Their brain hadn't finished developing. Oh, no. oh, <laughs> I know. That was terrible. Yeah. I'm sorry. Actually, anybody <laughs> listening to this that I just offended with a World War One reference? Yeah. Because <laughs> their grandfather enlisted at the age of 17 and died in 
you're not and actually you're... born. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 that could happen. I messed with the timeline. Anyways, keep going. <laughs> the timeline. Yes, I apologize, though. Don't come at me on the internet. <laughs> nah. Nah. We all cool. We cool. It's all good. All right. Well, while he was fighting in France, um, a German artillery did kill everyone in his unit except Chandler. Mm, so that's he was, sketchy. Yeah, yeah. It says he got a concussion. Mm. I don't know the exact circumstances. Uh uh-uh, uh, he murdered them all. <gasps> Maybe he did. Ah! Ah! Unless he was taken captured, like, he was captured at the end of it and, like, a prisoner uh, of war. It does not actually say in this. Oh, they probably thought he but was. But I'll have to. They he probably, totally yeah. Not. I mean, at that point, you're probably not going around looking at every single person to make sure they're dead. Yeah. Ugh. Definitely murdered all of them. Yep. Yeah. Well, he got discharged in 1919, returned to Los Angeles, tried his hand at poetry. Wasn't so great at it. They always do. I know. It's always journalist, poetry, back to novels. Yep. Well, he ended up working for Dabney Oil, where he was kind of like a top exec almost. Um, He was making $1,000 a month and had two cars, despite this being during the Depression. Mm, so he was good for him i know he was very well off for a little bit yeah you commit a couple of like mass murders in the war come back and you get big in oil i feel like that's a true story i feel like that's happened i don't know i don't know why but i'm thinking back to like mad men did he kill everybody no i don't know no he just took the guy's name Mm. i feel like this is a movie though if you guys know what movie we're referencing right now, that where we don't know that we're referencing, that we have no idea that we're referencing, because I'm not smart enough to come up with this shit on my own. <laughs> it just sounds really familiar, though, doesn't it? It does. Like you, something happened in the war, you come back, you become an oil man, a Texas Gats- oil man. I don't know. Like I think of the Great Gatsby, because didn't Gatsby like go off to war and then come back and be super rich, or am I making that up? I can't remember the timeline. Wait, yes, he did, because he came back for, like, an officer's ball or something and saw Daisy yes. with another guy. Maybe yes. it was Tom. Maybe. And then... I have to say, I the Great Gatsby, I don't love it. Oh, my gosh, I love the Great Gatsby. <laughs> I don't love F. Scott Fitzgerald, so oh, we've talked about this. I do this. love F. Scott Fitzgerald. <laughs> We're going to have to read the Great Gatsby, or maybe one of his other works. Ooh. Maybe we'll see how I feel. Yeah. Because that's my thing on this podcast. That's what Raven does. She hates something, and then you tell her, and you then tell I convince me. you not to hate it. Exactly. And then I'm like, okay, well, I guess I don't hate it anymore. Yeah. See, there you go. Open in minds, open in books, yep. we'll do it all. Exactly. Anyways, keep going. Raymond Chandler. All We're right. like 30 minutes into this podcast. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay. Okay. I'll wrap it up pretty quickly. Uh, he was this big exec, but he, and he got really into drinking excessively and womanizing they always and do. was fired. <laughs> So then he moved around a lot. Um, He actually fell in love with a woman named Sissy, who was married to somebody else at the time. Mm. And she eventually left her husband for Raymond Chandler. Mm. And then they waited for Raymond Chandler's mother to die and got married. (laughs) Jesus Christ. (laughs) Or he murdered his mother. Or he murdered his mother to marry Sissy. (laughs) Murder now. It doesn't clarify why they waited until his mother died. I'm going to go ahead and say if she was Irish born, she was probably Religious, Catholic. Yeah. And she probably did not approve. Yep. Of divorced women. Yep. Yep. So they married and they moved around for a little bit. He started writing short stories because he was influenced by Dashiell Hammond, who was also writing short stories at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, for those of you who don't know, Dashiell Hammond is a big name in detective fiction for the Maltese Falcon. Ooh, Which another is, Humphrey Bogart film. Yep. Humphrey Bogart is just like swooping up He's, all these detective films. I mean, he is, you look at him and you're like, you're a you're, film noir detective. You're a hard-boiled detective. Hard you're a as gumshoe. hell. gumshoe. Not soft-boiled eggs. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where that term came from. I don't know. They've been in boiling water for so long that they're hard? No, I don't know. That sounded wrong. Maybe we should edit them. They're hard on the... Oh, Oh, God. Yeah. No, that's 100% staying in. Oh, no. Ginny's detectives are all hard. They (laughs) hard-boiled. Because they've been in the hot water. Okay. Uh, Okay, so he got really into writing short stories, and then he eventually branched into writing novels. And his writing process is a little bit interesting, and I'll talk about it a little bit more. 
Um, but he, for his novels, he was piecing together short stories that he had written and kind of like combining and interweaving them. So it's almost like the short stories are his first draft and then the novels are the finished product. Okay. But The Big Sleep, our book for today, was his first novel and he went on to write a lot more. Um, this genre, though, the noir detective crime in Los Angeles was incredibly popular during the time. And so Hollywood started picking up these books, these like pulp fiction books to make movies out of. Mm -hmm. So then he got into screenwriting, started writing a lot of screenplays, including his own for The Big Sleep. Oh, shit. Yeah, right? Mm, that's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. We didn't get to watch The Big Sleep before we started this podcast, but I want to. Yeah. It looks good. I love I, Lauren Bacall. So. I love Humphrey Bogart. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did that, and then one of the last books he wrote was called The Long Goodbye, and it was one of um, the few books that introduced a flawed Marlowe. So not the hard-boiled detective that we I'm know so and cool. love. Everybody loves me. Yeah, I'm so mm. flashy. I'm, I'm so like smooch on every woman. I'm mm. so silver-tongued. Yep, insubordinate. Mm -hmm. So it was really kind of different, and it um, brought a lot of social commentary to the hard-boiled genre. You know, whether it's realistic of, you know, the portrayal of men. Mm -hmm. Are they all, you know, kind of closed up and? I'm trying to refrain Do they have from... emotions, basically? Yeah, I'm trying to refrain from the saying hard-boiled. <laughs> Are they all just hard-boiled? They're all just in one yeah. giant pot that's constantly boiling. Yep, exactly. <laughs> but it brought a little more depth. Thank you. I was about to say character, and I was like, that's not quite right. But yeah. it brought a little more depth to Marlowe. It gave him some um, more personality. It gave him more of a, this flawed aspect that is what makes people people. Mm-hmm. Which so. probably ended up coming with, like, just experience with writing, too. Because I feel like, I feel like a lot of times the, you want your main character to kind of be this perfect kind of person as you progress your story. Yes. So that it's like, so the story is perfect. Mm -hmm. And other people are flawed. And they're dealing with those. And probably also, like, maybe Raymond Chandler, since Marlowe was, like, his main character in a mm -hmm. lot of his books maybe he saw himself in that character yeah and it's hard to deal with your own flaws yeah exactly you set up this paradigm of what you want to be and it's hard to bring that down to earth yeah exactly because that's mm -hmm. not what you want to be you want to be perfect you want to be perfect yeah you I want all it. the women to love you and smooch on you yep <laughs> There was, there was a lot of floozies in this book. Mm -hmm. but All right. Well, I will wrap it up. Um, he died in California on March 26, 1959 of pneumonia. He is still considered a master stylist who transformed crime and detective fiction in the 20th century. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Raymond so. Chandler. Good for you, buddy. Yeah. I think one thing I did forget to mention that was in his bio is he was, by all accounts, a very shy and private person. Oh. So he didn't blend in very well with the Hollywood crowd, it said. Mm. So while he was writing screenplays, I think he felt a little uh, like an outsider. Separated, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Very okay. much like his character, Philip Marlowe, who seems to have no friends and no family. Exactly. And doesn't like literally anyone. Does not. <laughs> Except for... He the silver-haired woman? Oh, yeah, the silver wig. Yeah. Mona. Is that what it, oh, yeah. Mona yeah. Mars. Yeah. Which was a mouthful. Mona Mars. They never actually say her name as Mona Mars. They say Mona and then her maiden name. And then after that, they just say she married Eddie Mars and they call her Mrs. Mars. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I should probably give a synopsis because you guys probably have no idea who Eddie Mars yeah, is. Yeah, who <laughs> any of these people are. Sorry, gang. Okay, quick synopsis. Um, Philip Marlowe is introduced in The Big Sleep. He is Chandler's main detective character. Um, Chandler writes many, many stories about him. He has many, many film appearances. And Humphrey Bogart. I would, <laughs> yep. I would even say he's probably a, a model for later detective fiction. Mm-hmm. So Philip Marlowe is introduced to us. He is visiting the house of a dying millionaire named General Sternwood, mm -hmm. who has received um, some gambling slips 
um, about his daughter, Carmen, asking for them to be paid. Who's a wild woman. Yes. Actually, both of General Sternwood's daughters are considered to be wild women. They drink, they gamble. Um, One of them is constantly without her clothes. Yeah, where Um, are her clothes? They're never on. (laughs) She's always in front of a camera. Her clothes are always off. Yeah, she's always naked for some reason. (laughs) Ugh, man. Um, so he wants Philip to kind of investigate, deal with it quietly, privately. Um, but in the course of that, Philip starts to get kind of deeper and deeper into the story. And there's all these moving pieces. People are winding up murdered. All of these different rackets are being uh, discovered. Um, and the big kind of overarching question that nobody... Well, I shouldn't say nobody. That Marlo never really asked is the eldest daughter, Vivian, married a bootlegger named Rusty Regan. Jesus Christ, the alliteration. I I know. I love the name, though. I'm like, good old Rusty. Rusty The bootlegger. The bootlegger. (laughs) Who is also from Ireland. Well, I shouldn't say also. Chandler's not from Ireland, but lived near the... You don't really get any rusty in this story either. You do not. That's actually one of my, my talking Your points. Your yeah. points. I love it. Okay. But Rusty has disappeared about a month ago. Just up and left. Didn't say anything to anybody. Um, took one of the cars. It was later found abandoned. Um, nobody knows what happens to him. So the general doesn't specifically ask Philip to investigate where Rusty went. Um, But it keeps coming up throughout the book. Everyone keeps saying, oh, you're looking for Rusty, Rusty. right? Or Mm -hmm. I know where Rusty is, or I can give you more info. And Philip Marlowe's like, I didn't ask. (laughs) Yeah, he's kind of like, that's not my job. I don't care about Rusty. (laughs) And then he eventually does. (laughs) Yes, and then it starts to slowly untangle itself. And you start to see the the webs connect, and you figure out what happens to Rusty. Yeah. But I won't tell you, because we don't spoil things on this podcast. Eh. Yeah, we I don't. Mean, we try not to. Yeah, we Sometimes we get to. a little excited and things slip. Yeah, that's true. But but yeah, overall, very much a, what do I want to say? I mean, it's oh. very like film noir. Like you really get that LA noir kind of like feel when you're reading it. Yes, that's actually so one of my questions. So before we do all of our podcasts, I always look up like what other book clubs are saying about the book or like the questions that they use. And um, Mount Prospect Library had a question for its book club readers that also read this book. And it was, when you were reading, did you see the scenes happening in color or black and white? I totally saw them in black and white. I did too! (laughs) I like, I didn't even think about it while it was happening, but I'm like... Yeah, no, I see, I saw, like, Vivian's hair and, like, Carmen's hair being, like, that basically, like, white. Yeah, it's, like, gr- yeah, like, that light blonde kind of color. It's, like, a shaded gray kind yeah, of. Yeah, exactly. And everything is in black and white. I totally saw it like that. Right? I did, too. And I didn't even think about it until I read this question. And I was, like, nope, I imagined it exactly like a movie from that era. I imagined it in black and white and people yeah. going into wooden wood-lined offices and the big Buick cars and yeah like big hats and feather yeah. like the what, 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 they described one of them as like a Robin Hood hat or oh, something yeah. like that or an archer hat and I was like I see that perfectly on top of their perfectly yep. finger waved hair I'm like I'm thinking of Ingrid Bergman thinking yeah. of Lauren Bacall Lauren Bacall I'm, for sure yep. it's all good I'm like I've got it all it's in there it's in my brain so I love it and I love it, I think, because it reiterates how influential the movies were. Yeah. Because you don't, when you read other books, you don't read them in black and white. No, I mean, it's, even books in, like, earlier times. Yeah. Or times you coming out. You don't like read the Great Shakes- Gatsby, you don't picture that in black yeah. and white. Or you don't read Shakespeare in black and white. Or at least I don't. That's true. I don't either. I mean, in, like, Pride and Prejudice, you don't think of that in black and white. And then I think, like, Great Gatsby really comes to mind because of the idea of, like, the color that – they bring up color a lot in The Great Gatsby. Oh, color is a very important aspect of it. The so, green light. The green light. But it comes out at the same time. It's, like, a similar kind of time-ish. Not really. But an earlier time where there's black and white film. But you still picture that one in color versus – 
Film noir is definitely it's in the name shadows and yeah in black and white and you think of it in that way and like there are films that come out these days that are kind of that film noir type mm-hmm. and those I think a lot of them kind of like cater to the black and white kind of film genre yeah it's interesting it is very interesting I mm-hmm. once I read it I was like oh my gosh mind blown I did read it in black and white I, yeah I definitely thought of it in black and white oh. I I don't think I real yeah I don't think I realized it at the time I was also actively looking up who they had play certain people oh that's another one of my talking points oh nice yeah like i i don't i haven't necessarily seen the film but i was like okay so lauren bacall is vivian and Mm -hmm. humphrey bogart is obviously marlo Marlo. and yada 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 so i like to see like who also was playing carmen and i had never heard of her before so i did that i like to do that because i did that with um it a lot (laughs) oh yeah to like get a because then you have to a name almost. Then you have like a, it's like a base reference, reference. almost. You're like, mm-hmm. okay, they kind of look like this. And when the book says they're bald, okay, now I kind of imagine that person is bald. Bill. Yeah, sorry. I'm very hung up God about that. Goddamn James McAvoy is not bald. I know. He's beautiful. Slap a bald cap on that man. Exactly. But no. Yeah, I like to, I like to do it because I like to compare where my imagination goes when characters are described. So I don't necessarily like, I didn't see. Well, okay, with it, it's complicated because I had seen the original one. So I kind of, like, thought more of the original cast Mm -hmm. when I was reading it, even though I had seen it chapter one at that point. But, like, for this film, I I think I tended to see, like, somebody that was similar to Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart. But everybody else, I saw somebody completely different than who they cast. Yeah, they're just there. Cool. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so one of my other talking points is... If they remade the film today. Oh, shit. Yeah. Who do you think would play Marlo or any of the characters? Marlo. Okay. 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 I don't know. I saw an article today for it. Have you seen Looper? No. It's got uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt in it. And he oh. is, he's in it, but they make his face look like Bruce Willis's face. <laughs> Because it's like okay. a time travel kind yeah. of film, and so oh, sorry, I I don't know why, but my mind is going towards Joseph Gordon Levitt with Bruce Willis's Willis face, and I'm like, that's not right. That is a hundred percent not what I want right now. Oh, I love it. I don't know. Who do you think? I'm trying to think, and um, I'm having a tough time. I okay. This people may disagree with this, but I really see Ryan Gosling. Oh, uh, yes. Marlo? A hundred percent. Because I just keep getting the image of him in Blade Runner stuck in my head. Where yeah. he's kind of like cold and kind of standoffish, but you know. There's also that movie that he's in that I'm thinking of um, where he drives Oh yeah, the car. He, yeah. Is it called Drive? It is called Drive. I'm drive. an idiot. Yes, Drive. Oh, it's called Drive? Yeah, yeah he has the drive. hammer and the scorpion thing. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That where he's like that. And then also La La Land is kind of... It rem- reminds me of that time period, oh, yes. and so he fits really well into that. Yeah, and he is such a wide range actor. Now that I'm thinking about he it, he really is. Like, I mean, rom com, yeah, serious films, yep. I'm sci-fi. Going, I'm going through right now and like trying to come up with who I would think. I think Tom Hardy. I'd put Tom Hardy in any film. Oh, there you go. To be honest, <laughs> any film him. doesn't matter. Any film, put him in. Uh, him as Pooh Bear, I would watch. Oh, I totally so watch it. I'm like now I'm trying to cast all of the rest of the Hundred Acre Wood. Uh, yeah, who'd be Piglet? <laughs> oh, Emma Thompson would be Kanga. Oh, all right, that would be so right. sweet. That would be. Oh my god. Okay, done okay. deal. Done. There you go. I like how I look up top actors and like they're all like. It's like Tom Hanks and uh, Denzel Washington and Robert De Niro. And I'm like, nope, nope, nope. Mm. These are none of the people that I... Love all of them, but definitely not a good not fit. Who I was thinking of for this. I mean, Marlon Brando comes up on here and I'm like, Aww. that he's... No. Yeah, no. <laughs> that doesn't work here. He was best as the Godfather. Yeah. He was amazing. Oh, that's a book we could read. Uh, How long is said book? Uh, That's a good question. It might be pretty lengthy. 
I'll yeah. look that up. I know. I was looking at um I was gonna talk about this at the I'll talk about it at the end. Basically what our next choices were gonna be. And you posted that thing on Twitter about the zodiac signs. Oh yeah. Did you read yours? I read mine. It's the great expectations that I'm like, Oh yeah, for Dickens. I was like, We can't <laughs> like we nope, can't. nope, 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 nope. <laughs> That's not gonna happen. Sorry, Charles. Okay, I'm gonna st- I'm gonna go with what you said. I like I like Ryan Gosling. I think that that one's pretty good for that particular uh, character. Yeah. I'm like going through now, and I'm like trying to find another one. Yeah. Steve Carell. That's who it is. James Franco is like 29 on this top actors list, and I'm like, really? Is he? Yeah. That seems like fake news. That I think this is fake news. It's probably uh-huh. like those that are like the most. Reese, no, it doesn't make any sense. James really Franco doesn't. cannot be the same age as me. James Franco is the same age as you? No, no, no I said no, he no. can't be. He's 29 on the list. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said he's 29 years old. I was like, nope, that can't no. be right. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm still looking. That's I'm totally still fine. looking. I also, I don't know what part I would want her to play, but I also really want Blake Lively to be in the film. She'd I probably be, be a good Vivian. Yeah, I don't think she's, like, childish enough to be a Carmen. Mm-mm. And I don't think she's... She's not childish enough to be a Carmen. Yeah, but I don't think she's, like, docile enough. You know who would be a good Carmen? Oh, who? Margot Robbie. <gasps> She'd be a fantastic oh, Carmen. Shit. Because, I mean, she plays Harley Quinn so well. Yeah. And she, I think she's maybe played those characters before. Jennifer Lawrence would be another good Carmen, I think. Ooh. Those would be really good. Yeah. Um, just a little, somebody just a little bit on the edge. I got, I have my person. I have oh, my who Marlo. Is it? It's um, Josh Brolin. I love oh, Josh shit. Brolin so much. And I think you'd yes. make a great detective. All right. Okay. Hollywood, if you're listening, we have we a cast, cast list movie. for yeah. you. You're welcome. That's the hardest part. Now yeah. you just got to film. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, you're seriously welcome. Everyone in Hollywood's probably like, yeah, uh-huh. Okay. John Hamm is another good option, too. I didn't see him as I was going down. But no, I also thought of John Hamm. Only reason I chose Ryan Gosling was because of his body build. Because mm. I think John Hamm is much more like a commanding presence, and Ryan Gosling's much more of a, like, fluid presence. That's a good point, If that makes too. sense. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. I think for the general, I maybe John like, Hamm, I like Donald Sutherland a lot. I think that he's great in anything he does. I think he'd be a good general. But yeah. Okay. Yep. That's my, right. that was, that's my cast. All right. I love it. We're sticking to it. We're sticking to it. I'm not making any other changes. No. Nope. I'm not doing any more research on that. <laughs> I was you like just here like <laughs> looking the, for days. the top male actors of 2019. Exactly. And James Franco was number 29. Okay. Uh, I used to really love James Franco. And then I slowly watched the spiral downwards. I'm like, no, he's actually just crazy. He's just crazy. Just crazy. I mean, and I watched him in like um, Freaks and Geeks. And oh, yeah. That probably started, I love Jason Siegel. Love him. Aww. He is literally, I think that Jesse and Jason Siegel are basically the <gasps> same person, yeah. personality wise. And so I was I like, it. yeah, it, and height wise, I mean, face wise, not really. But I was like, I love Jason Siegel in that show. But James Franco was kind of like, bleh. James franco <laughs> Yeah, he was a little too James franco for me. It's a little too much uh. of him. It's like in... Um, Eat, Pray, Love. I love that movie. I'm not going to lie. Oh, yeah. He's oh, also shit. in that. I forgot that. And he's so James Franco-y. Yeah. And I'm like, can you play literally any other character? Nope. Nope. He's just, that's, that's him. It's just James he's Franco. He's being authentic. Good for him. Yeah. You do you, James Franco. <laughs> exactly. Let's talk about the book. All right. Sorry, guys. We had a lot of segues in this one. It is a really good book, though. It is. Um, I think I very much appreciated the writing style of it it's very Uh, straightforward very uh yep one of the big questions about the book and one that a lot of people have kind of criticized is you never find out oh no is this a spoiler maybe no it happens early in the book i'm just gonna say it you never find out who kills the chauffeur you don't find out who kills the chauffeur. So if you've never read the book before, there's a car that winds up in the ocean just off a pier, and the police pull it out, and inside is a man. He's the chauffeur for the Sternwoods. 
This is a little spoilery. This is the problem with, like, a murder mystery. Because, like, I was going to say, like, okay, he probably ends up dying because he's the one that kills yada yada. Yeah. But you don't know. That's one of the mysteries that you have to try to solve. So, this episode, uh... (laughs) Sorry, it may be a little spoilery. Sorry. Anyways, let's keep going. Yeah. Because... But the, po- the point I was uh, going for is when Howard Hanks filmed it, his writing team was like, what the fuck do we do with this? Mm. Like, how do we write this in? So they went back to Chandler, and he replied that he had no idea who killed the chauffeur. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's interesting because Chandler's style of crime fiction was more about the atmosphere and the characters yeah. and less about the plot. He thought that an ending that answered every question was trying too hard and it mattered less to him than building a good, like, atmosphere. I totally see that now because, like, when I was listening to it, it was definitely focusing on the interactions that he was having with, like, Eddie Mars and, like, with Vivian and Carmen and the general, like, their conversations and, like, the police chief there were like mm-hmm. eight different police chiefs and i i lost yeah there's like a district attorney in there and then like yeah. a detective but then yeah and i kind of ended yeah. up losing track of like all the people but it almost seemed like when action was happening it kind of wasn't it wasn't focused on as much as kind of the relationships that he was forming with these other characters and building out these other characters unless he was talking to a woman Oh, we can get into that. We will 100%. Yeah. This book really opened my eyes, and I was like, Raven, you have to start actually enjoying books because all these like classical books are not going to be written by feminists who enjoy women. <laughs> yes. Everybody hated women. It's fine. It's just we started to like each other more yeah. recently, I guess. There we go. So I just have to start getting used to that because that was like one of the things I like I messaged Ginny early on and Mm. I was like, does he even like women? Like every character is a floozy. Every character is described the same. Every all of them like sound idiotic. And that could have also been I had to read it on Audible. So and it was a man reading it. And he just starts talking like this. And this is how every woman talks. (laughs) Oh, it was so fucking bad like listening to carmen talk i was like i think she is <laughs> mentally <laughs> deranged yeah oh that's another one of my talk we have so many good things to talk so about. many talking points yeah i'm gonna come back real quick to chandler's yes. writing style Let's do it. um yeah it's not i only started about to the, ramble no you're good <laughs> it's not only about the characterizations but he takes really great care to set the scene he tells yeah. you exactly what every room looks like you know what the weather is outside you know exactly where he is. And, yeah, for and sure. And he takes great care to, like, set that scene and that mood for it. Which, and, which is interesting. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, you're um, right. Which is interesting because, like, like I said, the action goes so quickly. Mm-hmm. And it's almost, like, natural. Like, when yeah. somebody pulls a gun, like, it happens quick. And, like, it's not something that's anticipated. And so when everything starts happening, like, like when he's having a conversation with somebody, it's kind of, like, dragged out and like mm-hmm. long but then the action is like quick fast and you have to like try to catch up with it and that's kind of how it would be in real life almost yeah and so that's interesting and i thought something interesting about the action too is i read it almost as like deadpan like mm. there was no emotion to it there's no like oh shit that's a gun i'm nervous now it was just like there's a gun i did this this happened yeah that's Very, exactly like, right journalistic of him <laughs> yeah exactly or like how a level headed hard-boiled detective private eye would have reacted in those moments where it's like okay i I have no time to feel i have to do it's action yeah it's not emotional it's just action which also probably kind of stems from murdering his entire uh Uh, yeah whatever in the army yeah sorry no you're good (laughs) i'm just gonna bring that up it's gonna become like an actual like a little wikipedia note. I gotta, i'm gonna go research it if i find out that this is conspiracy theory i'll tweet it out to everyone i love it yeah you'll find it in the <laughs> All right, i'm going, to, I'm going to actually uh just make this rumor happen I, every time someone's oh, like oh yeah you should you write list- a wikipedia article i am gonna write a wikipedia oh. article i love it <laughs> i love it 
Anyways, oh, keep going. But, Action. But, yes. Yep. And this, so I've been reading a lot about the iceberg theory of writing, which oh. was developed by Ernest Hemingway. But it was the idea that, so icebergs, you know, they only show like the tip and then underneath is like seven eighths of the iceberg. Yeah. Took out the um, Titanic. Yep. yep. <laughs> Titanic killers. <laughs> killers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but the iceberg theory of writing is that um, you only ever show the reader one seventh of the story. And then the rest of the story is below the waterline behind the scenes. And it's just background knowledge. And mm-hmm. some of it can kind of like peek through, but it's not built mm-hmm. into the story. So it, Chandler saying, I have no idea who killed the chauffeur kind of made me think back to that where it's like there are things going on in the background that you know we as the reader don't see yeah um kind of the only difference is Hemingway thought that the author should know all eighths of the ice yeah Yeah. all eighths of the iceberg and that you leave out parts that um aren't conducive to the story and they're just kind of known but you don't tell the reader explicitly I love that. I think yeah. that that's really interesting. I think it's funny that Raymond Chandler is basically like, I don't know. Yeah. I, <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> I kind of love it in a way where he's like, I don't know who killed the chauffeur. <laughs> it's a fucking mystery, yeah, buddy. He, he, he's like, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> like, how am I supposed to know? Yeah. I'm not a detective. Yeah. I just, <laughs> yeah, Raymond he's Chandler. like, that's why I wrote Philip Marlowe. <laughs> he's supposed to figure it out. That's funny. Yeah. So yeah. I just thought it was very interesting, especially since Hemingway's was very prolific during this time as well. So yeah, definitely. You know, everyone you know is kind of running in the same writing circles, even if they don't know it. Oh yeah, for sure. And they all kind of have similar kind of styles of writing in a lot of ways too. Yeah, so. cause I think Hemingway's style is very similar to Chandler's, and that it's very just kind of like clean, kind of dry. There's mm-hmm. you know not a ton of adverbs there's not a ton of emotion in it they just tell you very strictly what the story is and you as the reader create your own kind of emotional reaction to it right exactly and i think that that really helps with like a murder mystery because when you're trying to figure out like what's going on in the story you rely a lot on your feelings and your kind of intuition like and your experiences and exactly so i think that that's very interesting all right, what else are we talking about? All right, um, do you want to jump right into talking about the women? Mm-hmm. The floozies? The floozies, There's all the floozies. There's literally no other woman in this story, I don't think, aside from floozies that try to hit on Philip Marlowe. <laughs> there was one woman, and she only had a very, very small part, mm-hmm. but there was a part where he went to a, because he's investigating a bookstore, at a certain point. Yes. And he goes to another bookstore to kind of ask around about questions. And he does meet a woman who works there. And he describes her as dark haired. She's reading a book when he walks in. And so she has a brain. Yeah. I think she was the only description of a woman in there where I'm like, oh, okay, I could get behind that. Yeah. That's she was... not Agnes, right? No, not Agnes. Okay. Um, I don't think they name her actually. She has a very small part. Mm-hmm. Um, basically he comes in and he says, I'm looking for a, I think it's a third edition Ben-Hur that has a double printed line on page 116. Oh yeah. And she like pulls out a book and she's like, that doesn't exist. And she's the only person in the story. I do remember this now. And I remember like it being described that she pretended like she knew what he was talking about. And I was like she probably does she works in this bookstore like it was still just kind of like kind of it's hard to describe because i I don't want to necessarily be like does he hate women <laughs> and does he think they're all just stupid but it's almost like he's just thinking that they're not as competent as maybe what Philip Marlowe would do. He's kind of like gatekeeping. Like, Philip Marlowe is like a gatekeeper where he's like, oh, obviously you don't actually care and you're not actually smart and you don't... Oh. Yeah. It's like those guys that kind of deal with it where they're like, oh, you like video games? Well, have you played such, 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 blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's silly. Yeah. yeah. Very silly. I took it to heart. So, oh. yes, I remember, <laughs> I remember that. But yeah. a lot of the other females are kind of like, Yes. And the only reason I bring her up is because I don't necessarily think he hates women. Mm -hmm. Um, Only because of that brief glimpse we get of her. And she's the only woman in the story that Philip, like, indirectly compliments. 
mm. because she lists off what the na- what the person he's tailing looks like, and he's like, "Wow, you would be a great detective." And she's like, "Not interested." Oh shit! Okay. Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of like good a yeah, it's kind of like an indirect compliment, almost like, "Hey, you're really smart and good at this. You could be a detective too." And then you know she's very flippant and was like, "Yeah, not interested in being a detective." Yeah, that's interesting. But yeah, that, that's the only reason I say that. The rest of the women in the story are very I don't think, stereotypical. Yeah, I don't think he hates women. Yeah. I just don't think he thinks very highly of women. Yeah, Vivian and Carmen are definitely I, not great characters. No, and that, like I think Vivian is uh, slightly better yes. because she seems a little bit more independent. She has a little bit more, um, I don't know, it seems like she just has a little bit more of a a better head on her shoulders like she has a better grasp of what's going on she's not so like ditzy and like um she i don't know she just seems like she kind of knows what she's doing but then also at another point she like tries to kiss him and she like faints into his lap or something like that and i'm just like what What? why 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 even so. Yeah, I think Vivian is definitely more competent and very early on in the book when General Stornwood is describing his daughters, he's like, yeah, Vivian went to school, she graduated, she got in with a bootlegger, yada yada, and it's like, and then Carmen, we get to, we find out she's bounced around all these different schools, she never finished, like, she's had a lot of problems with academics. Mm-hmm. So it's a, even up front, they very much distinguish them in that Vivian is smart and vicious, maybe? smart ambitious yeah and carmen is not as smart and vicious (laughs) yeah yeah no that's totally right because i mean carmen at the beginning she's like the first female character you meet she is and you're like yeah and you're immediately it sets the tone i think for the rest of the female characters in this story because you're like she is just so outrageously like flirtatious Mm -hmm. and she just seems like she doesn't have common sense and that's kind of a thing like that it well that's something that I think a lot of the characters are kind of shown to not have like with Vivian even she doesn't seem to have a good grasp of taking care of herself I guess like it just kind of seems like everybody's trying to get Philip Marlowe to take care of them and hold them and oh, to no. take yeah to like give them what they need and yeah. they can't get it for themselves yeah so that's kind of where I think almost all of them kind of go like because even not necessarily Agnes goes to Philip Marlowe but she kind of bounces oh, around men yeah, in the, the story as well that is true so oh Agnes good old Agnes yeah. I liked her character because she seemed like one of the other characters that kind of like, she seemed almost in charge. She seemed more authentic to me Mm -hmm. than some of the other characters. Like obviously Vivian and Carmen are kind of shifty and shady and you never know exactly what they're thinking. Right. Agnes, I was always very clear. I'm like, I know exactly what what (laughs) she's thinking right now. She's like, I don't want to die. Yeah. She's (laughs) like, I ain't doing this shit. Self-preservation. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I think she ends up like kind of go bouncing, bouncing around yeah. yeah she ends up Ugh. give i mean agnes good old agnes good old agnes i like agnes's character um can we talk real quick about carmen always chewing or sucking on her thumb oh my gosh that yeah. was like the worst thing it's so fucking terrible it is that's why i'm like it's like that um i don't know it's this thing that no offense to any men that all men are obsessed with where it's like that uh, like, I'm going to get into, like, porn talk right now, you guys. Oh, no. So, like, that barely fine. legal idea where it's, like, a grown woman and she's kind of childish and she's yeah. kind a of... Nympha. Yeah, and, like, men are, like, attracted to that, I guess, because, like, they could take care of her and they're more mature than she is and they can... She's fresh and these all these new experiences, so she could get take Like, she's taken advantage of. It's and, like Lolita. Yeah, it's exactly like Lolita, when which... How was Lolita published? Oh, yeah. That's yeah. a really good Hold question. You keep talking, I, <laughs> I love it how you related it back to literature and I related it back to pornography. Oh. <laughs> where I'm I like, mean, oh, it's just just it's turned just, legal uh, kind of stuff. But uh, Lolita wasn't written until 1955. Oh, so okay. after But it time. was a well-known kind of thing where, I mean, 
I feel like, I mean, that's like one of the whole reasons why older men marry younger women. Like, it makes you feel, I, well, I don't know because I'm not a man and I'm not an older <laughs> man, but it, like, it makes you, you feel younger and it makes, it gives you worth to yes. these beautiful women. And so that's why I always think that people kind of cater to making character, female characters seem a little bit more naive and infant like, but she's not, I guess she is kind of naive. Yeah, I don't know how to describe Carbon because she has certain bursts where it's like she's not naive necessarily. She's just kind of dumb. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of how to describe it. There's like certain bursts where you're like, oh, she's not that dumb and naive. But- and then she does something else and you're like, oh, you're an idiot again. Yeah, and you're like, no, why? <laughs> you Stop almost. chewing your damn thumb. Get yeah. it out of your mouth. Yeah. Ooh, sorry, I got <laughs> so ring. I got so upset about Carmen's thumb that I just uh, knocked my mic here. No, that's all good. Uh, yeah, no, Carmen Ugh. was so problematic. Just in because she does do things in this book where you're like, okay, she has some cognitive thought, and then eventually she just kind of she'll say something just so weird and so unnatural even well she repeats herself a lot too mm-hmm. which i thought was kind of interesting there's like a scene with marlo where she's in his apartment i won't say what she's doing but she's being stereotypical uh carmen mm-hmm. and she keeps repeating you're cute and he keeps saying you have to get out of my apartment and she's like oh you're cute and he's like you've got to get out of here <laughs> yeah you're cute and i'm like okay carmen like <laughs> get out of the apartment yeah and um in the audible the guy goes you're cute. Like, it's oh! so terrible. <laughs> and I'm like, ugh, get oh, out. No. I think I would hate the job of reading an Audible book because I'm not sure I could do the voices. I mean, he did really great, like, Philip Marlowe because he's, yeah. he's, like, low low voice. Mm-hmm. But the female characters that he has we're to do that is uh, terrible. Carmen not. specifically, because I'm like, maybe that's why I just, like, I can't fathom that there's somebody out there in the world ever that could have acted and behaved the way that Carmen did. I'm sure there are actually multiple people out there who have behaved and acted the way Carmen did. Yes. Sadly. Sadly. Don't be a Carmen. And if you are a a Carmen, get uh, medical help, mental health. Yeah. (laughs) Do you want to talk about that? Because you had messaged me early on and had said, I think, like, she has mental health issues in... I wish somebody in the book had helped her. And I was like, wow, I didn't get that part. I thought she was just kind of like a drugged up floozy that, you know, was kind of dumb. (laughs) I mean, and it could be partially because of like drug use. But yeah, she, her moods change so much so drastically that in her, just her, her education, she changed school so often. You're like, well, she probably has a learning disability. Yeah. And that probably kind of is influenced by, she maybe has bipolar disorder or something like that. And she eventually like has a seizure in the book. Yeah. She has an epileptic seizure. Yeah. And so, and she has an epileptic seizure because something happens and it's not right. And so it's like, I mean, I don't know how I'm obviously not a mental health, um, Professional. professional and neither was Raymond Chandler and he probably You'll didn't look no. too much into uh just kind of how these things happen but yeah like she ends up doing all these things and and you're kind of like she's just being taken advantage of by all these men and by people in general and I think she thinks at some point that that's how it's supposed to be and she's having fun but people are taking advantage of her and I think it's because she doesn't recognize what's happening is not good for her and nobody is helping her realize that and if she'd be if she'd gone to like a mental health facility like it probably would have been better but at that time a woman in a mental health facility was probably there for hormone changes and emotions and Uh, I think they just (laughs) immediately take out your uterus and they're like you're fine yeah (laughs) and they give you a lobotomy (laughs) and they're like you're going to be one of these wonderful placid women you're You're great (laughs) you're fine you'll love it yeah yeah oh no I lost my train of thought oh I'm sorry no you're good I'm trying to remember now oh shoot it was about Carmen mental health Oh, you're talking about maybe her having a learning disability and I was starting to think well maybe all of these like 
the reason she is so wild and the reason she is so flirtatious is maybe that's just become like a coping mechanism for her. Yeah. She's like, I'm not, she doesn't have the mental faculties to advance herself in life in other ways. And this has become a way to get ahead or get what she wants. Yeah, that's exactly right. Like she can't, she doesn't have cognitive thought and deep thought to be able to work these things out on her own. So she uses this as a way to, um, yeah, get what she wants and yeah. manipulate the situation. And this is the only way that she knows how to manipulate it. Yeah. And she gets what she wants out of it. So, And then it just becomes I this bother. whole vicious cycle because it works. So why wouldn't I do it? Yeah, that's exactly right. All right. What else oh. do we want to talk about? All right. Let's We've got, see. we're at about an hour and 12 minutes. So Ooh. we're running a little bit over. All right. We'll do, how about one more, one more talking point and then we'll wrap up. Okay, cool. No, I'm trying to pick which one. Yeah, now you have to make a decision. We spent so much time talking about murder and pornography at this <laughs> the point. The Roosevelt's. This yeah. episode went all over. I <laughs> yeah, we're it. all over the place. Let's see. Okay, here's maybe a good one. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, that kind of spoils it. I won't do that. Okay, let's do this one instead. Okay. So the title, The Big Sleep, is a euphemism for death. Yes. I want to know, I didn't think the deaths were like that big a part of the novel for me. Or it's not the part I focused on. No. The part I focused on was all this like intricate weaving together of these stories and how everyone was interconnected. The deaths were almost just like a byproduct for me. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And I think it goes back to, my thought is that it goes back to um, the action being so little of focus. Yeah, it's and almost like deaths happen very casual. I, I hate to say it casually, but it's almost like it he, is casual. He died, in the book. and yeah. I moved on to the next thing. Right, exactly, and maybe that's why it's the big sleep because sleep is so casual. Sleep is so oh. offhanded. Like everybody sleeps, everybody that's dies. A, that's a good point. This is just the longest sleep. Yeah, it's, oh, they're all taking title. a title. Super long nap. Yeah, <laughs> super long nap is the name oh. of this book. <laughs> And the big sleep, too, it almost softens the idea, I think, of death a little bit. And I don't know why, but this makes me think of Mice and Men at the very end with Lenny. Yikes. Yeah. And Lenny reminds me a little bit of Carmen in a way. I mean, because they both have mental health issues. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's almost like a way to soften death, almost. It's like, well, they're they're not dead. It's not final. This is just a long sleep. Right, exactly. That is actually a good point. Because that's kind of what I was thinking, too, where it's like, well, how would you explain death to somebody? Uh, yeah. Like, not necessarily like Carmen and Lenny are on the same kind of... No. Yeah. I they're... mean, if there's a scale, like a Kenzie scale for mental health, I think... Yeah, I is there? There <laughs> might be. <laughs> there probably isn't. But, um, like, Carmen has some idea of kind of... I mean, maybe she doesn't. Maybe she doesn't realize how big of the consequences are for her actions. I think she does, though, because she makes a very big deal to go and get back the photographs of her naked from the house and then from Joe Brody later on. That's a good point. So if she felt no shame or no concern about the consequences, why go to the trouble to get back those photos? It would just be like, well, whatever. Right. And I'm almost like, I don't want to ruin anything, but I'm like, those seem to be bigger consequences to her than other things. That is true. So that's why I'm almost like, maybe she doesn't fully understand. Or maybe she doesn't have the same scale that yeah. like normal people would. Like some things seem a bigger deal to her than they would to... I don't want to say normal people. That sounds that sounds terrible. Yeah, but it, it makes sense. Like but somebody that's maybe somebody has a better understanding of how finite certain things are. Yeah, maybe she's all seeing it kind of like as one, and she's like, "Well, this one keeps affecting all of us because they keep they keep trying to get money from us. Yeah, and they keep blackmailing us for this. So I need to get those pictures so that that ends in my family. It's yeah." So it's like she wants to end things. and Yeah, or wrap it up somehow. Yeah, exactly. Because that's kind of what she ends up doing with a lot of people and a lot of things. Yeah. So I'm She's, trying not to, like, ruin anything. I know, it's so hard with it's a so detective hard. novel. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. I'm like, oh, what You're can like, I say? You're like, does this spoil anything? 
that would definitely spoil something yeah. cute. So if you it want would. to know what we're talking about and you want to like join in on this conversation, you can always read the big sleep and then send it to us via social media and stuff. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. Well, should we go ahead and wrap up? I think we ran over our time. Yeah, let's wrap it all on up. So you can find us on the internet uh, at, I was about to say coopthepodcast.com, but you can kind of find us on coopthepodcast.com. Yeah, you can link through. Yes. Bookandbitch.com and then through our social media sites, Book and Bitch Pod on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Raven underscore co-op. You can find Ginny on oh, Twitter and sorry, Instagram. Oh, sorry, that nod was for me. <laughs> yeah, that was a nod for you. Raven just nodded at me, and I, like, nodded back You're at her. Like, and I was you like, you can't yeah. find her I was like, Twitter. yeah, exactly. <laughs> sorry, guys. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram <laughs> at glkeeble underscore rights. Yeah, you sure can. Oh, that was All really right. funny. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's wrap it up. <laughs> All right. We're going to end with a quote. Um, on the way downtown, I stopped at a bar and had a couple of double scotches. They didn't do me any good. All they did was make me think of Silverwig, and I never saw her again. Okay, bye. That's it. Goodbye. Get out of here. <laughs>